We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Paul, and I... 100% did not expect today's race day to be nearly as ridiculous as it ended up being. Like, I thought we were going to get a complete opposite of last year's Qatar Grand Prix weekend. And instead, we had all of this that we'll be talking about probably for the next hour. Well, you know, it's it's chaos reigns supreme. And whether it's on the track or off the track, it's never a dull moment now with the F1 and the FIA. Mm, the FIA, gross. Yeah. I mean, we'll get there. Yes, yes, yes. All in good time. But, but like, especially like even going into the sprint, which, and we'll talk about the sprint in depth in, in a minute, but I, I really thought like, okay, whatever. And, and just really based off, Last year in Qatar, which was six weeks earlier, all the drivers had to go to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. Like, you really thought that the following iteration of the Qatar Grand Prix would just kind of be like, we're going to be a little bit calmer and less ridiculous. And instead, they're like, no, we're going to like ratchet it up to 11. Yeah, they really, it, it reminds me of the, you know, right at the end of a sporting event, whether it be football or football or, you know, baseball or basketball, where the officials and the referees decide to take control of the game. Mm -hmm. And we're going to change the rules and move the goalposts as we go along. So don't worry about it. You guys just do the driving. Yeah. To be fair, that is what Michael Massey of no, Michael, no, that is so not right fame. Thank you again for the cup. Um, what a great cup. Right? Thank you for purchasing that for me. And, but anyway, Michael Massey took matters into his own hands and he got fired after that very contentious Abu Dhabi Grand Prix in 2021, which if you have not seen that yet, go watch it and then you'll understand. But really... Like, that's not what we want out of the sport. And the FIA has been so front and center in, in the media lately that, and it, it, it's just, it's not a good look. No, because, because what you really want, at least in my opinion, at the end of the day, is you want to have the teams and the drivers control how everything turns out on the track. And if that's not the case, it creates all kinds of conspiracy theories and why did this happen for this this driver that didn't happen for that driver? Those are the types of things that can be negative for you know your your overall uh, brand fans image. And- yes, and image. Yeah, correct. So before we get into all of that, let's talk about a couple quick hits before before of some minor pieces of news that came out over this weekend. Number one is for the team that gets the award of most ridiculous team name, which had belonged to Stake F1 team Kick Sauber and now belongs to Visa Cash App RB. Team principal Laurent Mekis confirmed that next year they will have a new team name that is Visa Cash App Racing Bulls. So the RB will no longer be two letters, but will be the actual, what we know that it actually is. And we'll actually be able to call them that. Yes. And of course, this these racing bulls will have nothing to do with Red Bull. No, no, they have nothing to do with it. Which, I mean, to be fair, it is getting a little bit closer to the previous incarnation of Toro Rosso, which literally is Red Bull in Italian. Correct. But at the... I... I it's still a stupid team name, and I, I get Visa and Cash App are, you know, giving VCAR, you know, boatloads of money to be the title sponsors, but at least it's racing bulls as it as you know, it, it is what it is rather than just two letters that are masquerading as something else. Yes, and and that's that's fine. I mean, you know, if it you know, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. Exactly. And then the next thing is the Qatari Investment Authority is buying a minority stake into Audi, the upcoming F1 team in 2026. And I thought this was really interesting for a lot of reasons. Obviously, Middle Eastern investment in sports has been growing bigger and bigger and bigger over over the years. And, but it is very interesting that they are taking the stake into Audi. And it's 
also because Audi's running out of money as a entity in general, while also still being like, they, they're kind of committed at this point. So they have to f- follow through and they have to find ways to get funds. And that's where, you know, Qatar comes into it. And I think it's, you know, it's good for them. It's good for the sport, especially because, uh, you know, Formula One wants Audi to be an engine provider at some point in time. So that is very important. What will be interesting to see is, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Lawrence Stroll was trying to sell a minority interest in Austin Martin. So how does this affect- has been for a while. Yes. How does this affect his negotiations with whomever he is speaking to? And what would this do for uh, the future of Austin Martin as an ongoing entity if he decides to tighten the purse strings? Right, right, exactly. And and then my other, the other glaring thing about it is that this is the continuing of Middle Eastern sports washing, which we all know is a thing that has been happening for many, many years and is, I don't like it. It, it is where it is where the money is. So, right. you know, you go, you go where the money is. I'm not, right. I'm not, you know, crazy about it either, but you got to go where the money is. Yes, exactly. So speaking of where the money is, and, and I, that actually is not even the segue, but <laughs> the really, the, the biggest news of the weekend is that FIA president Mohammed Ben Salayam has once again, still continues to be in the news for Lots of reasons involving staff turnover at the FIA and most significantly the firing of Tim Mayer, who is a 15 year race steward. He was the chairman of the stewards for uh, the United States Grand Prix in Cota and in Mexico City. And he was fired not by a text from Ben Salam, but by a text from one of Ben Salam's assistants. Well... There's a, they did a movie about this. It was called The Hunger Games. And I think they even had three movies uh, about The Hunger Games. So four. The, they, they split oh, the third book into two I'm, movies. I, I, I stand corrected. So, you know, it's the, la- the last one out can turn out the light. It will be interesting to see how MBS does when the uh, new agreements are uh, voted into after all of this is said and done. Because I don't, I, you know, because of the way the, this race was adjudicated, if you will. I would say it comes into question how the stewards were handing out penalties and and actually doing their job because the race directors you know, refer everything to the stewards. And right. the stewards decide what's good and what's not good. Well, so, it's the stewards to the race director, but yes. Yes, so, yes. So the... the Obviously, we've had a number of pri- high-profile exits. We've had their the FIA's communications director, their secretary of general mobility, the head of commission for women, the managing director, the technical director, the sporting director, the deputy F2 director, and of course, race director Niels Vidic. And I just think it's really interesting, A, that you know people are getting fired left, right, and center, um, but B... Mohammed Ben Salem stated prior to the race today to the media in response to, among other things, some of the statements that George Russell as head of the Grand Prix Drivers Association has has led to release, including that big statement from a few weeks ago. But he said prior to the race that if teams don't have to clue in the FIA on their own personnel changes, then why should the FIA, you know, let the drivers association know when they're making changes and that they should just focus on racing. Now, I fundamentally disagree with that statement because if this is the organization that is handing down rules and handing out things like penalties during the race and then of course the statement come you know from MBS comes out just hours before race director Rui Marquez went and I'm going to say it here, screwed up today in his second race as race director, then I don't think that's correct. And I do think that there is a little bit of a double standard here. I, I don't, I don't disagree with you at all. If, you know, in order to follow the rules, you have to have a clear and, and delineated transparent way of finding out what's good and what's allowed and what isn't allowed. And when you have all of these impending exits, you, you, you lose, 
you lose sight of the forest and the story becomes the FIA instead of the drivers and the marketed product, which are the races. Right. You know, you've expanded, you've expanded from 22 to 24 races this year. That's fantastic. So why in race 23 is the FIA becoming the story and not Qatar and Abu Dhabi? Right, exactly. So, and it's because Mohammed bin Salam wants to be, he wants to be the story. I, I think that it, what it comes down to is that this is really not a good look for, you know, for Formula One or A, Formula One and B, the FIA, but also kind of makes me think that this might be the beginning of a brewing battle that we saw in the Braun era where, where Formula One did attempt to divest itself from Bernie Eccleston and the FIA and turn Formula One into an independent entity from the rest of the FIA. And I think that if Mohammed Ben Salem stays in charge, and I think I've even said this before, that if he stays in charge and continues doing what he's doing, which has only gotten worse over his tenure as president, then I think we might see some backdoor meetings with all of the team principals and the team CEOs and ownership about maybe looking for something different if he's not going to, you know, find his way through the, you know, through the exit out the back. Well, the, the, and which also begs the, the obvious question, have MBS and uh, Bernie Eccleston been seen in the same place at the same time? Because if MBS has designs on becoming Bernie Eccleston, that's going to create problems for Formula One and the FIA going forward. Yeah, well, I don't think Bernie Eccleston would know if he had seen him just because I don't think he has memory of anything at this point and with his stage in life. But I, I do think that this power play that that he is attempting to pull with the most marketable entity in the FIA could heavily backfire. I don't disagree. I don't disagree, but we will we will see how it plays out. And, you know, we are we are quickly coming up on the winter season mm -hmm. and, you know, Things are going to start moving very quickly, and I actually have already started to move very quickly. Yes, uh, you know, into into season twenty five, and as this podcast only likes to look at the future, we are seeing moves by teams, which we will discuss in a little, a little while, that are planning for twenty twenty five and not, you know, planning, you know, not finishing the year out with you know any positive energy. Yeah, I think this is well. We'll get there. Yes, we, that, that, that is basically the cornerstone of our Who Disappointed section. But before we get into Who Disappointed, let's start with the Qatar Grand Prix Sprint, which I'm going to be honest, was a very middle of the road type of race. It was, it was not a banger. Uh, not at all. It was, it was not very exciting. There was not a lot going on. And, you know, for, for it to end the way it did, you know, Lando was leading the sprint from, from almost the get go had a wonderful start. And, you know, all of a sudden is this, you know, all of a sudden in the you know last half of a lap, he gives the, gives the race to Oscar. Now, congratulations to Oscar. I think he ran a very good race and they did go one, two, but. And he did that... fight George the whole time. Exactly. And, and, but was that payback? Question it, mark? It was definitely a makeup for Sao Paulo that my opinion of Lando Norris has kind of very quickly dropped into the basement throughout this throughout this season and throughout um the, the McLaren run. But what really what one of the things that I really did not appreciate out of McLaren was how as soon as Max Verstappen won the Sao Paulo Grand Prix race, it and Dinner time for Bishop. Check that off your bingo cards. They basically said, oh, we were never serious about trying to get Lando the driver's championship, which that literally they said two days after making Oscar give up two points so that Lando could have those two points for the fight in the driver's championship that they quote, weren't seriously going for that. I didn't really appreciate that, but I think that this looks better for, for McLaren. And obviously McLaren told Lando not to do it, which respect to George, it was a risky move. So I do appreciate it. I was watching the end of it and I was like, wait a minute, why is, why, why are those cars so close? Because he was supposed to have a big gap and then all of a sudden the, the, they were switching places. And I was like, okay, that, that, that was actually, I appreciate that because I really do think that Oscar got screwed this season. So 
I was okay with that bit, but the sprint was just not the best of races. No, it wasn't. It wasn't very exciting. Possibly with, you know, in the next, you know, engine and car conversion, it might get better because the cars will be smaller and, you know, more hybrid. But I just, I just didn't feel like, you know, anything was going on. It wasn't. No, it wasn't, and I And I think it's also because this is a track where the one place you can overtake is the main straight. And this is, this is a track that I, I just don't think is conducive for good sprint racing. And I, and and Emily and I have talked heavily about the fact that we agree that the shorter tracks on our calendar, Mexico, Sao Paulo, the Red Bull ring, those are better sprints because the tracks are shorter and the laps are faster. I agree. And, and even, you know, I think also the simple fact that they reduced the DRS zone. Yes. uh, This, this, for this race by 170 meters, that's a significant portion of the uh, DRS zone. Yeah. So that, I think that absolutely came into play. Yeah. And then the other issue with the sprint race is that, and, and you saw this very clearly with Red Bull is Sergio Perez, and we'll talk about him in more depth later, but he qualified badly and they just basically used him as a setup guinea pig for Max and also for, 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 you know, Perez himself for the Grand Prix race. And that's really all, if you're not in the points, then that's really all you can do for a sprint race. And that doesn't give the spectacle that Stefano Domenicali, who loves sprints and would love a calendar of 24 sprint weekends, that's not what we're having here. And that is to the detriment of, you know, a sprint season that with this new format this year was honestly less terrible than last year. I, and, and yes, there were some very, very good sprint races, but it was seemed clear to me that, uh, teams like Red Bull were using the sprint like an FP. Yes. And they were working on their setups and working on their racing trim because yes, all the cars were in park ferme for the, for the sprint race. But as soon as the sprint race was over, all bets were off and they could do all their conversions that they needed. And that's, I believe how Red Bull did so well today. Right. And that's, that's also what they did with, with Perez is they changed his setup, which led to the pit lane start, which the pit lane start was a whole other thing that was a, you know, that turned Paris into a a meme again this weekend. But that's why they did that is so that they could start playing with the setups from the start. And clearly it worked. And speaking of how well it worked, I'm going to get mad about something again, which is something that I've gotten mad about many times on this podcast. I'm going to get mad about the maximum lap time. Because if you don't know, the maximum lap time Are you talking about the Delta? Yes, I'm talking about the Delta. So this all started in Monza in 2023, where after qualifying, it was noted that both Ferrari drivers, and this was with a Ferrari car on pole in Carlos Sainz, both Ferrari drivers were noted to have have had breached what is called the maximum lap time, which is basically race control. The race director says, here is the slowest you can go on track. And if you don't, you know, if you go slower than that, you'll get in trouble. Now, this is during a year of extreme Max Verstappen dominance, if you remember 2023. And it is this was one of the first times that he was not on pole and it was a, it was, it was a non Red Bull pole. And of course, Carlos signs in a Ferrari at Monza, the home of the Tifosi, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing came of them breaching the maximum lap time because if they had breached it and had a grid penalty and a Ferrari driver lost pole, the Tifosi would have rioted. And then Ever since that race, every time there would be some sort of announcement that so-and-so breached the maximum lap time delta, nothing was done because the precedence was set by the race director in Monza that nothing would happen until yesterday when Max Verstappen, who had poll over George Russell, the president of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, drove too slowly for whatever reason and he was given a one place grid penalty just one now there could be an argument that george russell who was also on a cool down lap 
was driving too quickly relative to his cool down lap versus Max Verstappen, who had just gotten out of the way, I believe, of Fernando Alonso. So you've got Niels Vinich, who is said over an 18 month period, we're not going to penalize you for Delta time. We're just going to note it. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, we have our friend Rui who says, well, you know what? Maybe it's time. But who let, you know, everybody know that, yes, we're going to enforce it. If you're going to, if you're going to enforce it, a rule, great. Tell everybody you're going to enforce it and everybody will be prepared for it. Right. If you're going to just be arbitrary and come out and say, well, he did it wrong this time, Max, and therefore we're just going to penalize him, the, the one grid, grid place, you're creating a, what I believe is a very dangerous precedent. Which is continuing from the precedent of Max said a bad word and he has to become a better person and do community service. But Charles said a bad word during the FIA press conference, but he felt bad about it. So he just had to pay a fine that was cut in half anyway, because that's very consistent as well. And yes, those were, you know, different FIA personnel, but it's the same difficult precedents. And then also coming on to the continuing adventures of is the FIA and are, you know, the race directors going after Max, you know, are they targeting Max specifically as Max Verstappen has kind of implied in interviews? Well, and if, if you heard uh, any of the pre-race commentary, which I hope everybody did, George Russell basically said, you know, have, have you talked, when asked, have you talked to Max? He said, yeah, Max has already told me he's, I'm pissed off. So, George knew that Max was coming. Yeah. And, you know, even it, at, the, uh, at the same point, and slightly to be a little bit off track, you know, you had uh, Zach Brown, who was talking about these things, and he was already backtracking on McLaren's uh, uh, goals of the day. Right. So, and, and of course, Lando comes up and says, I don't care what they do. You know, it's not my problem. They're in front of us and we have to catch up. Yeah. Which was exactly the right thing to say. And then even Max is like, I don't care. I won my driver's championship. I'm just ready for the season to be over so I can go on vacation, which I think that there are a lot of drivers who are feeling that right now. And we'll talk about them later. But I do want to point out when you said earlier about like, let people know what you're looking out for and what you're going to penalize in advance actually brings me back to something that wasn't penalized in Vegas. And we didn't know why, which was Carlos signs when he was. Yes. So I, I found out what the situation was. So if you don't remember from Vegas, Lewis and Lewis Hamilton, Carlos Sainz were racing. They were both told to go into the pits. And then all of a sudden Ferrari's like, stay out, stay out, stay out. And so Carlos, who was ahead, yeeted himself past the pit line, pit lane line. And everyone was like, okay, he's totally going to get penalized because drivers have been penalized for that. And I mean, even for like breathing in the general direction of that line going into the pit lane and nothing came of it. So I read somewhere that the reason why he was not penalized is because it was not pointed out by the race director. So there will be times where the race director will say, do not cross the white line in in this spot, in this place on track, or here are where we're, we're going to be focusing on track limits, blah, blah, blah. So going into Vegas, there was no emphasis in the race director's notes on crossing the pit lane lines, which is why they let it go. Okay. It's... I don't like that reason. I think that if you're going to do it, you should do it everywhere. But that is why Carlos did not get penalized. Consistency is a tremendous virtue in a sport that is governed by, uh, you know, inches and miles or kilometers per hour. And hundreds of seconds. And, and, and seconds and speed. Right. So, you know, when you have reaction times that have to be split seconds, you want to make sure that everything is clear and the rules are right. Right, exactly. And I understand that you can't have the, you can't always have the same set of rules from track to track to track because they are configured Uh differently. But I think that there are some things that they could afford to be more consistent about. And speaking of consistency, Max Verstappen actually won the Grand Prix race and he may not have been as consistent in winning as he was in 2023, but 
<laughs> this was his first win as a four-time world champion. So that was exciting. Yes. And I'm going to be honest. I did not think he was going to win a race after Sao Paulo. I didn't expect him to be on pole. No. Uh, at, at, at this race. And, you know, I really, here again, the design of the sprints in Formula One is to create more excitement for the fans. Mm, but when yeah. you have... I mean, yes, yes. Yeah, but when you have teams that say, yeah, that's nice, but we're going to work on setup because as soon as we get out of Park Ferme, we know what we need to do. Right. That cre that is counterintuitive and 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 counter to, you know, the the ultimate goals. Right. So so if you want to create Park Ferme for the entire, you know, for the entire weekend, that's fine. No, that's bad. No, no, no. I understand that. But I'm just saying, if you want, if you want to do something and create excitement, you have to give the, the drivers and the constructors the incentive to participate in that excitement. Right. And like, look, I get it. Free practice is like free practice. One doesn't mean anything and is not the most exciting, exciting thing in the world, especially on a non sprint weekend. But I do think that there is something to be said for having the practice sessions qualifying in a Grand Prix without having to throw in a spectacle in the middle that does, you know, is a throwing in a spectacle and B also takes away a, you know, two practice sessions instead of, you know, three, you go down to one. I do think that's, that's a lot. And I think that it, it's, it's not, it's not helpful. And I don't think it's good, but we've already discussed the problems with sprints. And I think that, you know, sprints are things that we have to just suffer through and endure. But yep. speaking of suffer through, suffering through and enduring, Max had to survive three safety car restarts and all of that chaos today after taking the lead from what is typically known as the, the weaker side of the track, starting in P2, again, going against George. And Max has, and we've, we've talked about this before, Max, for most of his career, has not been great off the line, but he has been better and better and better this year. And, and, if if you if you watch the start of the race, George had a better start off the line, but didn't take the most direct line to the first turn. Mm -hmm. So that actually not only cost him the lead from Max, but also put him into third place behind Lando right. at the time. So it it really created uh, you know George kind of created his own problem, and by the time everything you know, shook out with, you know, three safety cars in, in the first, you know, five laps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, George was six seconds behind and his day was basically over. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was not what we expected after another strong, you know, showing from at the very least his side of the, the Mercedes garage, but yeah, not, not, not great, but it was Max's ninth win this season and his 63rd overall. And I don't know. As the Red Bull fan, I was happy about it. I, Even if I, it blew up all my predictions. It Likewise. I just, you know, I think that Max is a savant when it comes to driving. Right. He learns as he goes. He does not make the same mistake twice. I'm not ragging on Lando, but, you know, there were some, there were some turns where Lando just either lost focus or didn't, didn't, do things in the way that he should have. And he was, he had the potential of running into the gravel more than once. Yeah. And that focus is something that Max has that I don't think any other driver has at this moment in Formula One racing. I agree. And speaking of not, not making the same mistake twice, the one time that Max and Lando went actually wheel to wheel after the second restart, Right. was some of the cleanest wheel to wheel driving we've seen, you know, between Max and Lando all year long. Obviously it doesn't matter anymore, but still they both stayed on track and it was not what happened in the United States in Kota. That is that is very true. I think that that was one of the most exciting parts of the race and the best the, the reason you know that that was good racing is you didn't hear any of the radio calls from either right. either port or either part party to say he did this or he did that. Both of them stayed on the track. Both of them stayed within the proper limits, and Max was ahead at the apex. 
Yeah. End of story. Yeah, exactly. So to round out the rest of the podium, Charles Leclerc epitomized like good things come to those who wait. Because as we we have said, and Ferrari themselves has said, and even going, you know, after the sprint race, Ferrari's not good in Qatar. And what happens in Qatar? We have Charles Leclerc in a Ferrari in P2 because all he had to do was not screw it up. And he didn't. And he didn't. He also didn't have a functioning drink system. And while conditions were not nearly as bad as they were last year in Qatar, this is still one of the most physically challenging races and tracks on the calendar. And to not have your little baggie of water, you know, working, that's really difficult. I I don't I don't disagree. It, and I think that he, his car is actually one of the more like we've heard mo- more often than not about his you know faulty drink system than most other drivers on the grid. This is true. This is very true. Yeah. So, and in third, Oscar Piastri did very well to what I think is salvage what could have been an absolute McLaren disaster, and. You know, I think he just felt lucky to be there. Yeah, yeah, he he was he was really just just kind of there, and you know, go, especially after a one-two in the sprint race, where a lot of people, in, including us, were like, "Oh, they're not going to clinch the constructors' can- championship in Qatar," and then all of a sudden they go one-two in the sprint, and we're like, "Oh, they might clinch the the constructors' camp- championship in Qatar," and then they very much didn't. No, no, um, and we'll discuss that in a moment uh, as to uh, why they didn't. Right, which why they didn't <clears throat> was Lando. I don't even know if I, I put that put that in there, but yeah, let's just uh, yeah, I didn't even Wanna put that get... in there. Oops, I forgot. We let, we'll talk about it in a sec. So let's talk about the constructors, and then we'll talk about the race director. But in the constructor standings, first and foremost, Red Bull as we expected, is officially out of contention for the Constructors' Championship because that's what happens when you have one driver who's scoring the big points and then you have Checo Perez. We'll get to him in a second. Yeah. So the the current battle is McLaren has 640 points and Ferrari is 21 points back with 619. It's going to Abu Dhabi. It's going to be whichever of the two uh, cars finish, finishes highest. It's going to be difficult for... Ferrari to to overtake them, but it's possible. And also, speaking of Ferraris, Charles Leclerc is only eight points back of Lando in the Drivers' Championship for P2. And Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, P2 doesn't mean anything, except it does. And if Charles Leclerc can have another race where he lucks out into a podium, then he could conceivably overtake Lando for P2 in the championship. And Lando goes from totally not going for the driver's championship to totally going for P3, which is going to, wherever Lando finishes is going to be his best finish in his F1 career, but it's definitely one of those ending with a whimper type things. Yep. Well, and, and if you, if you look at formula one racing as a whole compared to the other racing circuits, especially in the United States, there is significant money and significant advertising that is associated with the place a driver ends up in during the season based on their points and where the constructor ends up in their season on the points. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But, you know, it's not just only about the winner. There are different races within the top 10 constructors, top 20 drivers that have significant uh, uh, meaning in terms of money available, in terms of time in uh, wind tunnels. There is there is lot a lot riding on this. Yeah. It th- now contracts are not generous as when Kimi Raikkonen got a bonus for every point he scored when he was driving with Lotus back in the day, which we talked about in our F1 genealogy project, and because we we love that story, but you still do get, you know, bonuses the higher up you finish in the championship. And you also get a boatload of money as a team, depending on where you finish in the championship. So to move into the $30 million fight for P6, it had been going into this weekend, a fight between Alpine, Haas, and V-Carb. Now I really think it's just between Alpine and Haas because V-Carb is, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, are, they are moving back because V-Carb really 
has not been strong down the stretch. But no. Alpine has suddenly woken up, apparently. Gasly finished P5. They moved back over Haas to P6. Haas only picked up four points this weekend, two from K-Mags in the race and two from Hulk in the sprint. So they're five points back in P7. And then you have V-Carb, eight points back of P7 with 46 points. So there's still a lot of room for movement, obviously, especially if somebody, you know, like nobody saw Akon and Gasly's, you know, double podium coming, which is what rocketed them up the standings. So there's a there's a lot going for these teams going into next week in Abu Dhabi. Yes, and the the only thing that gives me some pause for Alpine in sixth, uh, and I'm going to talk about this now, is is the fact that Esteban Ocon will not be driving Probably. in Abu Dhabi. Reportedly. Reportedly. Yes. Reportedly. So this is actually interesting for a lot of reasons. And I, so to really quickly move into di who disappointed, I would say, you know, obviously it's not Espen Ocon's fault that he got part of Franco Colapinto and Williams' 16th crash of the season on the opening lap, which is a whole heaping helping of yikes. But he was talking in the media pen and basically implying that this was going to be his last race for Alpine. And we know that his relationship with Alpine isn't great. There was a very significant risk that he was going to be benched mid season after the incident with Gasly in Monaco. But this, I do believe caught Alpine off guard. I was watching the F1 TV post-race show and Alpine's team principal, Oliver Oaks, who, if he is going to go anything like his two predecessors, uh, time time is ticking to Spa next season where he, you know, probably will get fired. <laughs> we'll get fired, yes. But right. he, was, he was asked, is the plan for Esteban Akon to drive in Abu Dhabi? And he said that was the plan. And I don't think he's media trained enough because he, you know, he is new to the to the position, not new to being a team principal, but new to being a, a Formula One team principal. I don't think that he was trying to obfuscate. I think that that was originally the plan. And then all of a sudden you hear Akon saying in the media pen, like, mm, no, I'm done. Yeah, well, it will create some, uh, you know, some something very interesting because, uh, you know, while Doohan is a good driver and has participated in one or two FPs, FP1s, I think he's done two. He's he's done a number of them throughout the throughout the last couple of years, as because he yes. has been the reserve driver since Oscar Piastri left Alpine to go to mm -hmm. McLaren. But what was actually really interesting, I I, I just before we started recording, I looked, I, I looked it up to see, cause everything that we have heard right now, it is Sunday night at about six 30 in Arizona. Everything that we have heard so far says reportedly there has been nothing from Alpine themselves. We will probably hear about that tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest. It would shock me. It'll probably come out at like one o'clock in the morning when I'm done editing this episode. But apparently one of the reasons why Akon kind of decided to fire himself if we're going to put it this way is so that he can do his postseason test with Haas without any interference from Alpine just with like a, okay. it's, it's like a, it's it's basically like a contracts thing and does it look good for him to to duck out the last race of the year no not really but this does give him a fa apparently a faster opportunity to get into the Haas car and start preparing for 2025 with Haas than it would if he stayed with the team and and drove through Abu Dhabi all right i and and to me it's it's not it's it's truly not a good look because you know if you are contracted to a team you have an obligation right and you know we'll talk about this now i know that lewis hamilton who had a very difficult time in the in the race today and was not happy with the balance he was not happy with the car itself couldn't figure out why he was running one one to one and a half seconds behind the leaders, mm -hmm. you know, and and wanted to just you know just put a fork in his career. This is a guy who was a seven time world champion, right? And you know you've got you've got you know I'm going to compare. You don't hear Fernando Alonso, who is a two time three time world champion, two, two time world champion, saying I'm going to take my marbles and go home. 
Right. No, you hear Fernando Alonso say, my back is killing me, but I'm going to finish this for the mechanics. Exactly. But, and, and I mean, I have said many, many times before that 2021 Abu Dhabi fundamentally changed Lewis Hamilton as a driver, but not to this extent. Like, things right now are like Lewis is going to need to go on like a darkness retreat or something at the, you know, at the end of the season to mentally prepare himself for the trauma that's coming for him at Ferrari, because, you know, every time the the graphic popped up of Hamilton radio, we knew it was going to be something bad. We knew it was going to be something terrible. He wanted to, he was like, please, please let me retire the car. And they're like, no. And he very much threatened that he was just going to do it himself. And then they said, retire the car. And he said, ah, no, we're finishing the race. And he forgot to hit the pit limiter during the safety car period when they were going into the pits and had a drive through penalty, which we'll right. talk about Rui Marquez again in a second. But it was just really not, a, it was not a good day for Lewis. It was not a good day for Franco Colapinto. It was not a good day for Esteban Ocon. And it was also not a good day for Sergio Perez, who officially will finish eighth in the championship, the lowest position for a champion's teammate since Jos Verstappen, Max Verstappen's dad, finished P10 in 1994, the year his teammate, Michael Schumacher, won the championship. Well, you know, as as you have often said, time is a flat circle. Time is a flat circle. So there's that. Now, right. really quick, let's go into who, who impressed, and then we'll talk about how Rui Marquez is bad at his job. But okay, that, that sounds good. And, and you just heard Luna getting fit. Hi, Luna. So Zhou Guan Yu and Sauber finally finished in the points. Yes. And, 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 and Valtteri Bottas was so close. Yes, I was, so close. I was texting you a lot in all caps because Lando was making his, his drive through the back of the field. And I just said, go away, Lando, which obviously Lando did not do. But Bottas was just off the points. He was very disappointed to be just off the points. I saw the statement that he posted after mm -hmm. after the race on, on Instagram. I think it's probably like the most annoyed he has been after a race because they were so close to both of their drivers scoring points. But what I thought was also really interesting is the last time Sauber scored points was in Qatar 2023, which, as we have emphasized, was more than a year ago. So it has been right. a very long time that they have even sniffed near the points because before that, yes. the closest that Joe Guan Yu or any Sauber driver got was, words, Catherine, was when he finished P11 in Bahrain this year. That was the closest they had been for a very long time. A very long time. And this is, you know, Joe does not have uh, a drive next year. And there is talk that he is going to become uh, a reserve driver, I think, for Ferrari. Uh, I don't think so, but I, that is that is what that's, they that's, have that's been one saying. Of the, that's that's one of the rumors. But this is you know this is you know for for teams that don't make you know the bowl games and don't make the tournament, this was uh, Sauber's tournament, and uh, good on them for putting a car out there that had been improving throughout the second half of the season. Right. And especially during these last, uh, these last two of these three races. So, you know, I, I'm, I was very happy to see uh, Joe Grenu get the, uh, uh, get to P8. Yeah. And we can only hope that Botas gets to, to just even, even to P10 in Abu Dhabi next week, just so they, they both can have scored, you know, Botas will do whatever Botas wants to do, which is probably become the Mercedes reserve driver. But it would be nice for for him to to score points as one of the you know favorite yeah. presents in the yes. in the paddock. But the good thing about the uh, drivers drivers championship uh, listing is that is that Valtteri Bottas is now ahead of Logan Sargent with his P eleven finish. Yes, he is no longer twenty third in a twenty driver championship. He's twenty second in a twenty driver championship. Exactly, exactly. It's these little things that mean a lot. Yes, which is of course aggregate best finish. Also, we've been talking long enough that uh, they are now putting on ESPN two the replay of this morning's race. So that is going uh -huh. to be on in my background now. Let's talk about Rui Marquez being really bad at his job. And this is the most significant moment of what had really started off as kind of a boring race. Like, yes, Lando and Max were within two seconds of one another at the front of the field. But 
I mean, the McLaren is so good at managing their tires that I was just waiting for the McLaren to wake up and overtake Max and for Max to just be like, okay, cool. I'll try to fight, you know, a little bit and then take second and just, you know, this, the, this Red Bull is not the fastest car on the, on the track. And right. then Alex Albon's wing mirror flew off his car on the main straight. And sat there for how many laps? Four. Four laps before. So here's here's the problem with where it landed. Obviously, it was on a part of the track that you can avoid. It was not on the racing line, except it was in one of the only overtaking spots on this track. You can really only overtake on the main straight, and it was off the racing line on the main straight. So what does Valtteri Botas do? Because he's fighting to get into points. He runs over the mirror, breaking it with his car, sending debris everywhere, which is exactly what was predicted. While everybody in commentary is like, okay, where's the, like, Where's the safety car? Where's the virtual safety car? And I understand one of the one of the reasons why it could have been delayed was they were trying to figure out if there was enough of a gap between Max Verstappen in first place and whoever was in in the back. I think at that time it was Kevin Magnuson. Like, right. was would that be enough room for a marshal to go run on the track, grab it, and come back? Because you can't just have him, you know, you can't have a marshal run onto the track and then go on to, you know, just go onto the other side because right. there's still, you know, that's still a risk for, you know, cars are, are heavy and they will hurt if they hit you, as I say all of the time when I am leading the children on the hike every summer. So, correct. So they wait. And then Valtteri Botas runs over it, which is the last thing that you want. And of course, immediately you've got, you've got two cars with a puncture and you know, it, it's creating all of this unnecessary havoc in a race that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Cause I mean, yes, Lewis Hamilton was having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad race, but Carlos Sainz got very lucky that it didn't actually demolish his race as, as it could have. He was able to get back into the pits and actually because it took. So first of all, instead of having one piece of debris on track, that's really easy to get rid of. You now have lots of pieces of debris on track that you have to sweep away, right. which is not right. as easy and is why Lewis got one of his penalties was because the Mylander who drives the safety car drove everyone through the pit lane so that they would have time to clear off the main straight. But by the time you get to that point, the damage has been done enough. And like, and that is also where Lando got his penalty because mm -hmm. Lando was going after Max and there were double waved yellows on the main straight, which means you must slow down and prepare to stop. And Lando did not do that. And no, a Lando Lando was basically penalized for ignoring uh, double yellow flags in in the first zone, and was you know had to you know I think got a got a ten second penalty. No, no, no. He got a ten second drive through penalty. Ten second so, drive through penalty. So this is something that we have not seen. Since I've become a Formula One fan, I don't, I don't believe that there, so there are, there are two types of penalties. One is a penalty, one, one is the, the typical pit stop penalty where when you pit, you will get your penalty, or if you don't serve that penalty before, you know, what, you know, when, when you still need to pit, it will just apply after the race. A drive through penalty means you have three laps to serve your penalty or you're getting another penalty, which means that you can't think about hit windows or, or anything like, like that. You have to go and you are released anywhere that you end up, which for Lando, when he's, you know, taking 36 seconds to get through the pit lane, serve his, his penalty and get out was P15 of the 15 cars that had remained. Right. And, and my first question in my head was, I thought they got rid of the drive through penalties years ago when everybody was, you know, when you had essentially a pit penalty where they can't touch the car or it, it affects your, it affects your, your time standing at the end of the race, yeah. but a drive through penalty get, could affect, could technically affect 
your next race. Right. Which also because they, because they flow through. Right. Which also one of the reasons why Lance Stroll was told to retire the car and then didn't at lap seven and then eventually did retire was he had a penalty. So they said, stay out, back in, serve the penalty and then retire, which is, of course, what happened with Sergio Perez in Japan, where he double DNF'd two years ago in Emily's favorite race to remind us of, of her why Checo was her favorite driver. But yes. that, so that is why Lance Stroll did that. So that way he wouldn't have a grid penalty for Abu Dhabi, because if you don't serve your penalty and if you don't finish the race, it turns into a grid penalty for the next race, which I think that's all fair. I think handing Lando Norris a 10 second drive through for getting through double waved yellows. I think that was excessive. I, th I think it was very excessive. And here again, you are in invoking rulings and rules that, you know, if we haven't seen it, most of the constructors haven't been prepared for it. Right. So they don't know that they're going to have to deal with those things. So making the rules is fine. Enforcing the rules is fine. Consistency is the virtue. And yes, I'm sorry, MBS, but you have to have consistency and transparency. Right. Which, I'll get off my soapbox. Now. Which they don't like transparency. But even Lewis Hamilton, when he got his penalty for speeding in the pit lane, that was also a drive through. It's never a drive through penalty. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. Like, exactly. like if it's done during the practices, it's a fine. If it's done during the race, it's a, it's a five second penalty. And I mean, I don't think you can even say that because it, it was, you know, it was that harsh because all the, all the, the pit stops had already finished. I, I don't think that's legitimate. I agree. I agree. But yeah, it is even what it is. Andrea Stella in the McLaren team principal, I know we hear a lot about Zach Brown, but the actual McLaren team principal, Andrea Stella was, was asked about it afterwards. And he, and he, he made a comment of like dusting out an old rule book. And, and basically if you're going to be consistent about it, be consistent about it. But right. like, like we've said, this is not something that we've seen in years. We don't see drive through penalties anymore. And it's not like Lando murdered anybody. <laughs> That's true. It's, um, you know, here again, here are the, here are the stewards and, and the officials who are, are, you know, the race director taking the race out of the driver's hands. Right. And that's not where it's supposed to be. It's Correct. supposed to be, you want, you want it in, in the driver's hands and you want it in the car's hands and you want it to be won or lost on the track. Yeah. Like that could have been a great battle between Max and Lando that we didn't get today. Right. Which I mean, as the Max Verstappen Red Bull fan, I'm not not mad about it, but it should have been. I agree. Anyway, I agree. we've been talking about this for an hour. Let's talk predictions real quick, and then we'll talk about F1 account if we talk if we have to. We actually do have to because Emily and I both scored points this week. Yes. All right. So for sprint pole, sprint pole was Lando. Emily and I actually picked Lando. You picked Oscar. Wrong, McLaren. And sprint podium was Oscar Lando George. Emily actually picked Oscar Lando Charles. So she was ah. very close to picking up five points, which I know she'll be kicking herself, especially since she made these predictions a week before the race while headed to the deserted island that she is currently on. Correct. So she's going to be real thrilled when she, when she gets back and, and listens to this episode. Now, <laughs> sprint P8 was Max, which... Who saw that coming? We didn't. Not, not on anybody's bingo card here. Nope. I picked Akon. Emily picked Checo, which could have been reasonable. And you picked Nico Hulkenberg. Now, yep. for pole for the Grand Prix, obviously, Max won pole and was penalized for something stupid. And it was given to George. But neither of us chose either of those drivers. I chose Lando. Emily picked Charles. And you had Carlos. Oops. Right. And then the podium... None of us saw, saw this coming of a Max Charles Oscar podium. Um, oop, surprise, yay. Well, and then similar to the sprint P8, nobody saw Max coming, nobody also saw Lando Norris coming as the, the P10, you know, finish of, of the weekend. Yeah, 
Yep. And then for, yeah. for biggest surprise, I said that it would be a surprise if McLaren won the Constructors' Championship, which they did not. And Correct. you ha said that there would be one safety car and no more than two retirements. So And I was completely wrong. Completely wrong. And I am currently watching the the first safety car portion of the race on the, the re-air broadcast on ESPN2, where there were three safety cars and five retirements. Five retirements, And yes. then for who was going to do a dumb, I was fully expecting Ferrari to shoot themselves in the foot, which they shockingly did not. And yep. you said that McLaren will screw up the Constructors' Championship and give it to Ferrari for Abu Dhabi, which I think that the door is pretty wide open for an upset if... And I, I don't expect that we're going to see Lando having another 10-second drive through penalty, but I do think that the McLaren versus Ferrari battle is going to be a lot of fun to see this weekend. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's basically finish in your in mm -hmm. and you're going to have to figure out your tire strategies and make it, make it work. Exactly. So yep. that was the 2024 Qatar Grand Prix as ridiculous as last year, but almost worse. Um, yes. It, it, this, the same thing, only different. Yes. Time is yes. a flat circle, but not. Now, <laughs> let's move into F1 Academy. F1 Academy was really interesting this weekend for a lot of reasons. Number one, we have a champion. Abby Pulling, the Alpine driver, has won the driver's championship. She finished P2 in the first race. She only needed to, she, she needed to either win the race or finish P2. She overtook Maya Vuk to start the race and just... It it was it was it was gone from there, and she she got it. But one of my issues with this, and I said this in our predictions episode of like we we won't know the scenarios yet. I don't know if Abby can win in 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 Qatar. Well, the answer was Abby could win in Qatar, but F one Academy social media and even their just general media only promoted the ways that she could win like the day before the race, and we have had have had not had an f1 academy race for weeks now so they really should have been promoting this sooner they i mean they were promoting the battle for last year's championship which admittedly was a lot tighter for weeks going into to the final race that marta garcia eventually won so mm -hmm. i was i was a little bit perturbed that it took them so long to acknowledge that abby was on the verge of winning going into this weekend it would have been nice to know that. What was actually really interesting is after after the race when she was being interviewed, at one of the, the things that Abby gets this, this year is she wins a fully funded seat in GB3 for 2025 with Roden, which is her current team. And she talked about, and this is actually something that is is really prevalent in, in Formula One and in all of motorsport, is she talked about how she has struggled financially to continue competing at the level that she's, you know, that she's been competing at. She had to leave British F4 midway through the season because she ran out of money. And, you know, every, every winter period is like, oh, well, I don't really know what I'm doing financially. So this is a really great opportunity since she's won the championship for her to move on to, to this next series and know that she's going to have a full season with them. And that's, that is just fantastic because as you well know, if you look at, if you look at farm teams in baseball and we, we know people in farm teams in baseball, if, you know, you have to get it, you know, you have to get a second job sometimes just to be able to, to, to do the, the game and the, uh, the sport that you love. I mean, and look at American really track and field athletes in the, at the Olympic level. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. So. Race one was a Dorian Pond uh, victory, and wild card driver Alicia Pomoski actually finished P5. She ended up overtaking Leah Block. She started from P6, so she had a really great race. The problem is race two was canceled. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. There, so there was a crash earlier Sunday morning, and they could not repair the barriers in time to allow F1 Academy to race before Formula One. So they had to cancel the race. Well, that's disappointing. That's a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. And it, I mean, but here's the other thing. It probably would have been the same results. And this also goes back to another thing that I've talked about with F1 Academy pretty heavily is their qualifying format sucks and needs to change because their qualifying format, if you don't know or have, haven't listened to me complain about the, uh, the qualifying is you're 
the grid for race one is set by your fastest lap and the grid for race two is set by your second fastest lap. But usually your second fastest lap is really close to your first fastest lap. So it really doesn't change the grid all that much. You might have like a change or two changes, but you're really not going to have a lot of differences. So I don't know what they're going to do for next year, but they need to do something different. I happen to like the uh, qualify. You know, if you're going to have two races on, on a race day, um, I happen to like the idea. And I think they do this in Formula E where they will invert the reverse the field grid. The yeah. Do a reverse grid. And that create, that can create some excitement for the second race. Yeah. There, there's questions of like, should it be a full reverse grid? Should it be a reverse grid of those who are in the point scoring positions? Like what, what could it be? They had, they had had a reverse grid in last season of F1 Academy. They also had three races in F1 Academy, but I, mm-hmm. I would not be opposed. Well, I wouldn't, I don't actually, I would be opposed. I was going to say I wouldn't be opposed to them having what they used to do with in, in the old sprint format of you qualify for the race, you race race one, and then race two, set, race one um, finishing position sets the grid for race two. But mm-hmm. I still think that that also might not lead to a lot of changes in what a grid looks like from race one to race two. So that's something that Susie Wolf is going to need to figure out over in the off season and we shall see. Yep. Yep. And then constructors wise, there were no changes throughout the weekend. Prema, which is Dorian Pond and Maya Vug's team. They expanded their, they, they grew their lead over road and motorsport. Um, they're at 332 points. Roden is at 304. Compost is really, they're stuck in the middle and I think that they would like need to sweep both races in order to move out of P3. ART Grand Prix has got 125 points and MP Motorsport has 122 points. So there's three points between them. So that could shift, but I think Prema might have this in the bag for the second year in a row, unless, you know, Roden Motorsport can do something different. The problem for Roden is Roden is really just Abby pulling. Like she's, yeah. she's, Roden has Abby pulling, Prema has Maya Vug and Dorian Pond. So it's very difficult for, you know, in, unless another Roden driver manages to pull something out of the hat, we might yeah. not see any, any movement from there. And then up next for F1 Academy, as with Formula One, we will see them in Abu Dhabi for the season finale. And hopefully they will have both races. That would be, that would be optimal. Yes. That would be terrific. And I think that it helps for uh the success of that you know of of f1 academy to have both races right you know it it really it really makes it makes a difference yeah exactly so real quick some final thoughts final thoughts qatar was something a race Uh, it, it was uh you know instead of having drivers that were collapsing because of heat stroke you had you had drivers that were having uh, issues coming out of turn one and three safety cars and it should have been a fourth safety car immediately but was decided to have one later on right so and you know it's it rules changes you know you've got to have you got to have consistency if you're going to have success with what the fans want to see Right, exactly. So I, I, I don't think anybody expected for to us to have two consecutive Qatar Grand Prix that are going to be, you know, heavily referenced over and over as we tend to do on this podcast. I think that one of the most commonly referenced race that we go back to is always Qatar 2023, and I do think that Qatar 2024 is going to be right up there with them. And I think we just oh, might absolutely. need to have like a Qatar playlist to point people of here are all of the reasons why Qatar is ridiculous but it was it was a lot it's going to give us a lot to think about i think that formula the fia is about to implode which will be interesting but abu dhabi will be exciting and it will it will be a fun battle between mclaren and ferrari i agree i agree it should be a it should be very exciting a lot of fun i think that you know, Max is going to come out and do Max things just because he can. Yeah. And we'll see what, uh, we'll see what, uh, shakes out. I think that, uh, Abu Dhabi is a better track for Mercedes 
Yes. So that will create some opportunities for George and Lewis. And, you know, hopefully we can have Lewis leave Mercedes with the honor and glory that he deserves. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously not my favorite driver, but nobody wants to see a driver this historically talented, this miserable with his situation with the car. 100%. 100%. So... Up next, we will have our Abu Dhabi predictions episode on Thursday. Emily will be back from the deserted island that she is currently vacationing on. So we will see her then. Thank you again for joining us this weekend. And thanks for going off track with us, guys. Thank you.